Praise the Lord. I invite you to take your copy of the Word of God and turn to Jeremiah chapter 28. We're going to continue on with a very, very interesting narrative of things that are happening here. Uh, back uh, two weeks ago, we really kind of started into this little scene at the temple. Uh, Jeremiah with the yoke on his neck. And this yoke had great symbolism that God had a message to declare to the people, take the yoke on. And the yoke was symbolic of submission and captivity to who? To the king of Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, if you'll take on the yoke, if you'll take on the submission and the servitude to Babylon, you will survive. And if you fight for your freedom, you will die. And this is the message that uh, Jeremiah from the Lord gave to the people at the temple and also dignitaries from other nations who were there as well to not just uh, say it to Judah, but to say to all these surrounding nations, thus says the Lord, Nebuchadnezzar is going to, I am giving him the power and you need to submit if you want to live. Picking up the story in chapter 28. Now in the same year, the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, the fifth month, Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the king of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I'm going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's host, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I'm going to bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles of Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Mm, great message. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests, in the presence of all the people that were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord confirm your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all the exiles from Babylon to this place. Yet... Hear now this word which I'm about to speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people, the prophets who were before me and before you from ancient times, prophesied against many lands and against great kingdoms of war and calamity and of pestilence. The prophet who prophesies of peace when the word of the prophets come to pass, then the prophet will be known as the one whom the Lord has truly sent. Mm. Then Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, So Hananiah the prophet took the yoke of the, off from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and broke it. And he said in the presence of everybody, Thus says the Lord, even so will I break within two years the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations. And then the prophet Jeremiah went his way. I got a, a little illustration this morning. It's a story uh, I, I used a year ago. As an illustration, I want to revisit it today and give you an update because uh, it's a little more added on to it now from a year ago. And it's also just a great illustration of something that's happening here in Jeremiah chapter 28. So last year, a federal appeals court ruled that a 40-foot cross-shaped war memorial that, stood, that has stood on public lands in Maryland for nearly a century is uh, un unconstitutional because it excessively entangles the government with religion. So a divided U.S. Court of Appeals from the Fourth Circuit in Richmond, Virginia, found that the Bladensburg World War I Veterans Memorial, which many of us know is called the Peace Cross, they said that it, it aggrandizes the Latin cross to the point that an observer would conclude the government entity that owns it is endorsing Christianity. <gasps> How horrible. The Latin cross is the core symbol of Christianity, the court wrote in a 33-page opinion that included photographs of the memorial. And here it is, a 40-foot tall, predominantly displayed in the center of one of the busiest intersections of Prince George's County, Maryland, maintained with thousands of dollars of government funds. Erected in 1925, the cross honors the 49 Prince George County residents who died in World War I. The ruling was a victory for the American Humanist Association, which filed the initial lawsuit. The Washington-based group advocates for the separation of church and state. Government war memorials should respect all veterans and not just those of one religion. Roy Speckhard, the group's executive director, said in his statement, 
The American Legion is representing in the case by the First Liberty Institute, a Texas group that says its mission is to defend and restore the religious liberty across America in our schools, for our churches, for the military, and throughout all of the public arena. Now, Jeremy Dyes, an attorney for the Institute, said the group is reviewing the decision and they're considering an appeal. I think it's very discouraging for the thousands of veterans across the country who have been basically told their war memorials are suspect if any religious imagery appears near them. Dyes said, I think it's important that we honor veterans the way that veterans choose to honor themselves. The opinion was written by Judge Stephanie Thatcher and joined by Judge James Wynn. Supporters of the memorial have raised the impact an adverse decision could have on other sites, notably Arlington National Cemetery. Crosses are common on headstones and everywhere in the cemetery. A 24-foot granite cross, the <clears throat> Canadian Cross of Sacrifice, is positioned near the tomb of the unknown soldier. The court dismissed that notion that the two sites are related, though the crosses there are much smaller than the 40-foot tall monolith on the issue here, the court wrote, and significantly, Arlington National Seminary displays diverse religious symbols, both as monuments and individual headstones. So Chief Judge Roger Gregory, writing in dissent, questioned the legal significance of the cross's size. In the majority view, the memorial is unconstitutional based on predominantly on the size of the cross, and neither its secular features nor history could overcome that presupposition, Gregory wrote, but such a conclusion is contrary to our constitutional directive. So they won that they get to tear the cross down because it's so horrible to combine church and state. Well, here's the update of the story. This month, I saw uh, July 7th, it was reported that First Liberty Institute representing the American Legion has asked the Supreme Court of the United States to protect the memorial. And though it talks about the cross as it stood at the entrance of the National Defense Highly for nearly a secretary, the United States Court of Appeals Fourth Cir Circuit recently determined that the memorial is unlawful. The court determined that because of its cross shape, the design gold star mothers and the American Legion used to recall the battlefield grave markers of, the, of Europe under which their sons have been buried they don't like that cross. It's placement on land acquired by the state of Maryland. That means it's violating the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. That opinion has placed the memorial's fate squarely in the hands now of the Supreme Court of the United States. On behalf of the American Legion, we've asked the court to review the Four Circuit's decision. Absent a review and reversal, the future of the gravestone of the 49 men of Prince George's County is uncertain. What is more, if the Supreme Court does nothing, other monuments and memorials, whether the lush greens of Arlington or small towns across America, could be destroyed. Question, as we watch this drama unfolding. The separation of church and state is always stated as the reason for these acts. But does anyone really believe this concrete monument is making the government Christian? Do people really believe that folks driving uh, along see the, see the monument and it dawns on them, I ought to believe in Jesus because that cross is sitting there on the highway. You know, there's crosses everywhere. Have you noticed that? Right? People don't just become Christians for seeing or wearing crosses. Did you, did you ever notice how many rock stars and rap stars wear crosses? I just Googled that just to see, and you know, Aerosmith. Steven Tyler wears crosses, and Ozzy Osbourne's always wearing crosses, and Madonna's wearing crosses all the time, and, and 50 Cent's wearing crosses, and Little Wayne's wearing crosses. They're all wearing crosses. Just a cross in and of itself really isn't making Madonna or any of these people Christians, is it? All these countries have flags with crosses. Do these flags flying over these countries make all the citizens practicing Christians? You think? Is there any Bible verse where God says church buildings ought to have crosses displayed? I don't think there's any verse that even talks about church buildings, temples, but not church buildings. Does God even say the cross represents Christianity? No, not explicitly. So a concrete cross on the side of the road isn't really entangling anyone with religion, and yet people are really put out, offended, 
and want to get rid of it. So why? What's the real problem? Well, the cross is a powerful symbol, isn't it? It symbolizes what Jesus did for us. It reminds us of the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was crucified on a cross to pay the price of all of our sins. And sure, Rome executed thousands of people on crosses, but nobody really knows them or the names of any of those people. But a large percentage of the world knows the name of Jesus, and probably they uh, know that this cross is somehow affiliated with Jesus Christ. As a symbol, it's so very effective, and that's why people hate it, and they want it taken down because they don't like the message. It reminds them of the message that they don't want to hear, and they don't want anyone else to hear. So they think if we can make the symbol go away, we can make the message go away. It's not really about separating church and state. It's about hating the message of the cross and wanting it to be silenced and never have, can be reminded of it. This is the rationale behind what Hananiah is doing here in Jeremiah chapter 28. The Lord gave Jeremiah a very powerful image to go along with his message. And Jeremiah is standing there in the temple wearing this big obvious, awkward yoke of wood on his neck, and he's declaring, thus says the Lord, take the yoke, take the yoke so that you do not die. And the yoke symbolizes what? Submission, slavery, and captivity to Babylon. Jeremiah's message is, you, if you serve Babylon, you will survive. If you don't take the yoke, if you fight Babylon, you're going to die. You're going to die. And he's wearing it. And it, it's, it, it's, this yoke is just really delivering the message. It's just so obvious, and it's this great effective illustration. It, it, it's a powerful symbol, and it's getting everybody's attention, but they don't like the message of it. it it's getting the message across, but they hate the message, and they don't want to accept the message. A couple of years ago, a few of us went to a Monday night football game. It was the Redskins versus the Seahawks. And, of course, most of the crowd was wearing Redskin gear. But my good friend Eric Brown was, of course, wearing his beloved Seahawk gear and jerseys. And he's standing out in this sea of burgundy and gold. And he's cheering for his team. And whenever the fans boo the Seahawks, they boo Eric. And... Uh, and then they're kind of jeering Eric, and they're making fun of Eric. And uh, there's a lot of heckling, and I'm thinking, why did we bring this knob along with us? We should have <laughs> left him in the parking lot, but here we are. You have to fight all the drunken Redskins fans to get out here alive. At any rate, Eric uh, took it all in good fun, and we had a good laugh about it. And, of course, Eric got the last laugh because the Seahawks won, which was quite expected, especially a few years ago. But... Uh, with Eric, with a different team's jersey, a symbol of his fanhood, it was making him stand out, and it was making him the opponent, it was making him the enemy. Now, Eric could walk around Seattle any day of the week wearing Seahawks stuff, and everyone would just think that's lovely, and they would all smile at him and high-five him. No big deal. But I bet it, he wouldn't get nearly that many smiles if he was walking around Seattle with one of these on. Yet again, another symbol that seems to get people's attention. And some people like that message, and some people don't like that message. And when they see it, they heckle the person wearing it, or confront, or even try to take that property away, thinking if I can get rid of the symbol, I can somehow get rid of the message. Here's another symbolic act that has a very effective way of sending a message. And likewise, this symbolic act is drawing reactions out of people who don't like the message. And again, the thinking is, if we could just make them stop doing that, we get rid of the symbolic action, we're going to be able to get rid of the message. And so that's exactly what Hananiah, the false prophet, thinks he can do. I'm going to destroy Jeremiah's symbolic yoke, and in doing so, I can void his message. So verse number 10, Hananiah the prophet takes the yoke off the neck of Jeremiah, and he breaks it, and he says, the Lord says, even though I, he says, uh, I break the, the, within two years, the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar from the necks of all the nations. And that shuts Jeremiah up and says, Jeremiah goes away. So um, 
Hananiah does this, and, and what do you think everyone said when he did that? All these people in the temple. Well, probably people were like, woohoo, yeah, get him, Hananiah. I hate that yoke. I hate that yoke message. Get rid of that message and stop him. It, 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 it's so offensive to our, our temple, and it's so offensive to our priesthood, and it's so offensive to our king and our military to tell us that we all have to go into submission and slavery when we're all there. Our good people are fighting for our freedoms, and, and now you tell us we're going to be slaves. And that's a very natural reaction. When someone is saying something that we find offensive, you just want them to shut it. Right? You just want to tell them to shut up or call them names or use anger or threats to manipulate and control. And we see a lot of that, don't we? When, when people don't like a message, they try to drown it out with cursing and name calling and chanting. But that also violates a couple of principles that many of us believe in, don't we? Because we believe in the freedom of speech. And people do have the right to express their views, even if they're not popular views. Taking talking about kneeling for the national anthem. Many of my military friends would say, I find that personally offensive, but I would fight for your right. I would defend your right to do that. Freedom of speech is important because it allows for all of the ideas to be heard and then tested and then proven to see which is right. And the best ideas can win out if they are heard. The best ideas, the best arguments can be made without cursing and name calling or threats of violence. And then they can debate, be debated and stand on their own merits. I never have to curse or name call or threaten someone physically just because I disagree with them. I can engage in civil discourse, can't I? And most intelligent people prefer that approach, no matter who's doing it. It's kind of that, what is that value we have? Do unto others as you'd have done unto you. Yeah, I don't want people to talk to me in that manner. If I want people to listen to my point of view, I ought to be courteous enough to take the time to listen to their points of view as well. So probably some people were hostile at Jeremiah and wanted to scream and physically attack him, but most people probably just wanted him to stop it. You know, just, would you please stop standing there with that yoke on? You know, it's just kind of an awkward, uncomfortable message, and you know, I don't come to the temple to, to feel bad about myself. I, I come here because I want to be close to God and and, 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 and feel good about myself. But, but then I hear Jeremiah telling me that God's angry at me, and that just makes me feel so bad about myself. So probably most people were relieved with Hananiah breaking the yoke and then prophesying that the Lord has said the yoke will be broken. And Hananiah's message is this positive message. You know, thus says the Lord, I've broken the yoke in two years. We're going to bring back all the vessels. And in, in two years, Nebuchadnezzar and all of his power is going to be broken. In two years, our good dear king, Jeconiah, is coming back. And all of our exiled brethren, they're all coming back. And, and uh, it's, it's all going to be restored to us. And, and everyone's like, yeah, that's a great message. And even Jeremiah himself affirms this idea. He affirms this message, uh, something that we would like to see happen. In verse number 6, the prophet Jeremiah says, Amen. Amen. May the Lord do. May the Lord confirm your words which you've prophesied to bring back the vessels and bring all the exiled brethren back to this place. And so then it kind of sounds like Jeremiah is contradicting himself here, doesn't he? By amening Hananiah's message, it sounds like he's contradicting himself because Jeremiah, we studied in chapter 27, said the vessels were going to be taken to Babylon. And everyone is going to go to Babylon. But now he's saying, may the Lord confirm Hananiah's prophecy. Sounds like he's agreeing. What's going on? Yeah, I think so, Norm. I think it's sarcasm, right? He, he, he's not agreeing that Hananiah is right. He's agreeing with the idea or the sentiment, I would like that to be true. That would be great if... God would bring our people back and would bring the vessels back. Jeremiah doesn't want to see the people go into bondage. He doesn't love his message. He doesn't wish slavery on his people. But what he wants and what's reality are two different things. You remember, Jeremiah had already said, let's look at what happens to the vessels as proof of who's the real messenger of God. If the vessels come back, then the guy who says they're coming back speaking on God's behalf, but if the vessels all get taken away, 
then that will prove who's speaking on God's behalf. The person telling the truth will be known by their, what did we say last week? Track record. Can be known by their track record. So Jeremiah doubles down on that challenge here. Verse number 7, he says, you know, hey, man, that's so great. May that be confirmed. Yet, hear now this word which I'm about to speak in your hearing and the hearing of all the people. The prophets who were before me and before you from ancient times prophesied against many lands, many kings of war and calamity and pestilence. The prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, then the prophet would be known that he is the one that God sent. So he said, when we see the peace, then we'll know that's God's message. So let's wait for the peace. But Hananiah, he doesn't want to wait for the peace, right? He wants that symbol gone, and he wants it gone now. So he takes it, and he smashes it, and he boldly announces, the yoke's broken. It's there. The symbol is gone. He smashes it. Jeremiah's prophecy is now voided. And then Jeremiah leaves. So problem solved. Yay. Isn't that great? What a great message. Let's just... Go downstairs and have some snacks and thank the Lord. What? Don't think the problem's solved, do you? No. Nothing's solved, is it? Let's look at the passage. Just because you get rid of the symbol doesn't mean you get rid of the message. That's a quote. Write that down. Just because you get rid of the symbol doesn't mean you avoid the message. Well, here we go. Chapter 28, verse 12. The word of the Lord came again to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of prophet Jeremiah, saying, go and speak to Hananiah, saying, thus says the Lord, you have broken the yokes of wood, but now you have made instead them yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations that they will serve Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and they will serve him and I've given him the beasts of the field and Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah the prophet listen now Hananiah the Lord has not sent you and as you have made the people trust a lie therefore thus says the Lord behold I am about to remove you from the face of the earth this year you're gonna die because you have counseled rebellion against the Lord hmm Verse number seven, so Hanani the prophet, he died in the same year in the seventh month. Question, I'm not very good with math. How long did it take Hananiah to die to prove Jeremiah's message? Just doing the math. And verse number one, it says it was the fifth month, and then he died in the seventh month. So that's, is that right? Two? Two whole months. That's pretty quick, eh? Two months? Do you think the people remembered what hit two months? Do uh, you think so? I don't know. Maybe they hit a YouTube video. They can go back and look at it. I don't know. It's good ministry. I think they probably remembered that, eh? I bet you they did. Looks like Hananiah didn't void the word of God just because he removed the symbol. Actually, he made it a whole lot worse, didn't he? It went from being a yoke of wood to being now a yoke of Iron, meaning what? That's right, right? Iron is known for being strong, probably the strongest substance in Jeremiah's day and age. As a matter of fact, even in our day and age, we will still say something's ironclad. When we say ironclad, it means it is impenetrable, right? It's just unbreakable. So the imagery of the iron yoke is it's even more sure, it's even more severe, it's even more, if it's even be any more inevitable, it is now more inevitable. So it's worse now for Jerusalem. They liked Hananiah's message of hope. They ignored Jeremiah's unpopular negative message because that message made them feel good and it gave them instant comfort, but it didn't fix anything, did it? It just made it worse. It's now an iron yoke. Mm. So I was thinking, what is the application of this for us today? What does the iron yoke mean for you and me? And that was Thursday, and I didn't know, so I stopped writing my sermon and went home and had supper, and we'll pick that up Friday and try to figure that out. And I woke up Friday morning with, bam, in my head, like, oh, that's what it means. It's, the Holy Spirit does that for me often when I just, and then bang, because you know I'm really not this smart, eh? You know that. These sermons and the Holy Spirit helps me. 
helps me say these things. So I had the answer. And uh, I got to warn you, this iron yoke thing, it, it's going to hurt to tell you what it means. So in order to say this to you so you know that I'm not trying to hurt you and I wasn't thinking about you personally when I wrote this. Oh, I can't wait to, can't wait to lay this one in air. Ha, ha, ha. Take this, Seattle. So you know I didn't write this with you in mind. I'm going to hurt my family. I'm going to hurt people I love. And hopefully you will apply it to yourself and you will take your own medicine as you make this application. So if you know me, uh, you know the biggest hero in my life, the person that I always look up to the most is my, my dad, right? And Bob's been here many times and we all love Pastor Bob. He's a great guy. If you don't know, well, he's a little short. I don't know how we look up with him, but still, you know. In character, he's a, he's a huge hero in my life. Uh, I love that man. My dad's mom, my grandmother, she struggled with diabetes. So that runs in our family. And my dad, my entire life, was overweight and struggled with that. A struggle that, uh, with everything else going on in life, he just didn't want to deal with it. He didn't want to be bothered to work on that. He didn't want to tackle that. So he just ignored that looming problem that diabetes could happen. It was a wooden yoke. And he didn't address it. He just left it. Until, guess what happened? He got diagnosed with diabetes. And now it's no longer a wooden yoke. It's now an iron yoke. And it's ironclad. And it ain't going away. And it's not coming off. My grandmother smoked. She got cancer. She had cancer treatments. She won. She got cancer free. Woohoo! She didn't stop smoking. And the cancer came back. And she died of it. It went from a wooden yoke to an ironclad yoke. What am I trying to say, my friends? Lots of us have these things in our lives that we are slaves to. They are wooden yokes. We don't really want to deal with them. We don't want to hear messages about them. We don't want to go to the doctor and get these things checked out. We want to ignore them and deny that they have any power over us. That they're bringing us into submission. We'll ignore the yoke. We'll deny the yoke. If our wife brings the yoke up, we'll just, I can't just stop telling me about that. I don't want to hear it. That's not a problem. You know, I really don't talk to her that way, right? It would be scary. But, you know, it's how I feel. And then we ignore it, we lie about it, and that wooden yoke turns into an iron yoke. Oh, I had a scare, and I, I thought I had cancer. Turns out I don't. Looks like I'm okay. Don't have to change anything. Yeah, <laughs> no. No. You need to change. The yoke is still there. Don't kid yourself. You know what that is. Question, do we have to wait for it to become an iron yoke before we'll finally start making the changes? Can't we just deal with it when it's a wooden yoke and not have to wait till it gets worse? Ignoring a problem, denying a problem, lying about a problem is not fixing a problem. It's only making the problem worse. I tell young couples in marriage counseling, things swept under the rug are not dealt with. Just because they're hiding doesn't mean they're gone. Keep doing that, and next thing you know, you're going to have a whole mountain of dirt under that rug. And then you're going to say, we need a bigger rug, right? Doesn't that happen? We need a bigger rug. It just keeps piling up, and it's harder and harder to deal with, and it's still there. The yoke goes from wood to iron when we lie about it, when we ignore it, when we kick the can down the road. We know folks today, we are ministering to folks who are in prison because they ignored the wooden yokes, and now they're iron yokes. There's some people getting divorces because they ignored the wooden yokes, and now they're iron yokes. There's some people who are terminally ill because they ignored the wooden yokes, pretending it wasn't there, demanding it wasn't a problem, and now it's an iron yoke. And there's all kinds of examples of what these are. One, one time I was talking to this young dad, and he says to me, he says, I, I, I love my little two-year-old daughter. She's the sweetest thing you know, in all the world to me. She, she means the most to me. But you know what? She's such a brat, and she's so bad. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't even like being around her. So I says to him, I said, think about this for a minute. You're her dad and you love her and you don't want to be around her. How do you think I feel? 
How do you think the rest of us feel about dropping that bratty little kid off in nursery? And they're that horrible, right? I said, you need to deal with this before this grows into a bigger problem until you have this just nasty little kid that nobody ever wants to be around and you can't control and you can't discipline and, and they're doing things that just, you know, everybody wants to stay with them and you're, you're miserable and your home is miserable. And he says, you're right. I do need to deal with that. And uh, end of that story, that girl's 22 years old today and she's just a complete delight and they're Family's been nothing but harmonious, and they had another kid, and they all got along very best. So what did he do? He stopped ignoring the problem, and he did something about it. Well, what did, what, what did he do, Pastor Rob? What did he do? Well, I'll tell you what he did. He followed the wisdom in the Word of God. He stopped doing things his way, and then he started doing things God's way. And that was when he addressed that yoke. You know you. You know what's in your heart, you know what your habits are, and you know what's going on behind closed doors. What are you ignoring today that is a wooden yoke now that could turn into an iron yoke tomorrow? What is it? Let's stop kicking the can down the road and do the hard things now before it's too late and nothing can be done. Now the good news, brothers and sisters, is there's power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And when we go to Jesus and we go humbly and we say, I need help, please help me. And then we open up to the, the people of God who are around us, the brothers and sisters in Christ that God has put in our way with some expertise and with some ability who can help us. Some counseling, some coaching, some celebrate recovery accountability, right? And then somebody can get a hold of us and they can help get that wooden yoke off now before we get locked down with that iron one. But there's people here that can do that. There's people here that can help you. There's people here. Probably your loving wife would be one of those people that would help you and hold you accountable if we would open up and be honest and start dealing with these things. These things could be changed and Jesus could use his power to set us free from the fear or the bitterness or the hatred or the anger or whatever it is that's got us locked down, we would be set free through the power of Jesus Christ because that's what he does. Amen? Amen. Let's bow in prayer. As the uh, folks come back up to lead us in singing, singing another song of praise to the Lord Jesus Christ, of power and majesty and praise. We just pray that we would believe in the name of Jesus to the point that we would obey his word and that we would submit ourselves to his plans and purposes and that we would make hard changes in our lives, whatever the things are that's locking us down, that we would be set free, first of all, right now, right here today, by being humble and confessing it. And then second of all, taking a step to go get some help and advice and counsel about it. <laughs> I'm going to ask Brother Ted if he'd come up here this morning, stand with me. You know Ted's a leader in this church, leader of Celebrate Recovery. I'm going to ask Eliana to come up here this morning, stand with me as well. And we're going to have a couple people here this morning. As we sing this song, if you want to come down and talk to somebody, if you want to come down and come, you know we don't do this very often. But I don't know, I'm just feeling like the Lord might be sending a son on somebody's heart it's time to get this wooden yoke off. And you could come and talk to somebody this morning that could help you and pray with you and counsel you and move from, from slavery to freedom. Let that be our prayer this morning, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you'd just move in somebody's heart and that you would touch somebody and that you would set them free of whatever is holding them down. Break these yokes of bondage. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.